Great. Hello and welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for this Polymp webinar. Uh, this is the eighth and the final uh, Polymp webinar in, in, in this mini-series. And we'll finish up the mini-series with an outlook into the future and asking ourselves, is the EU, actually, is EU climate policy up to the challenge of decarbonizing Europe? Now, these webinars uh, are happening live right now. And thanks to all of you joining us here today live. Um, they will be recorded as well and then will be made available on the on the project website at polymp.eu and also as a podcast on iTunes. And there you will also find recordings of the seven previous webinars in this series. Uh, for those of you joining us live here today, you have the option of uh, um, bringing in your questions on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, you should have the opportunity to type in your questions and you can also vote up and down if you don't have a question yourself but you find something that's been already posed by somebody else which you find intriguing then um, you can vote up these questions and we'll try and bring them in uh, during the discussion part of this uh, event. Great. Um, quickly on Polymp. Polymp is a joint effort by different organizations from seven EU countries, research organizations and, and uh, consultancies and the like, think tanks, etc. Uh, it's funded by the European Commission under its seventh framework program for research and it's led by the Joint Implementation Network in the Netherlands. Now, uh, I myself, I am Benjamin Gerlach. I am head of economics at the Ecologic Institute and the Ecologic Institute is one of the partners in the Polymp, web, in the Polymp project and has been organizing this series of webinars, amongst other things. Great. Um, now, to the topic, is EU climate policy up to the challenge of decarbonizing Europe? I'm very happy that we are joined today um, by, for this webinar by Professor Michael Grubb. Michael Grubb is Professor of International Energy and Climate Change Policy at the UCL Institute for Sustainable Resources. He's also Editor-in-Chief of the journal Climate Policy and uh, Senior Advisor of Sustainable Energy Policy at the UK Energy Regulator of GEM. Uh, he's had many uh, previous positions that I won't go through now in, in detail in academia and also in, in the think tank world. Um, perhaps more importantly for today, he's also the author of uh, eight books and 50 journal research articles and several other publications. Uh, his most recent, uh, one of his most recent publications includes this book here, Planetary Economics, highly recommended reading, um, which uh, basically summons lessons and insights from 25 years of research and implementation of climate and energy policies, uh, published in March 2014 and uh, has received much praise from uh, different camps and different directions, uh, particularly for presenting a, a new approach to the, the theoretical underpinnings and also the, the policy realities for energy and climate policies and thinking climate and energy policies in a new and an integrated way. And so we're looking forward to hearing some of the insights that are documented in this book, but also um, making them, applying them in to, to uh, the realities of European climate policy. So the question for today uh, is indeed, what does it take to decarbonize the economy of an entire continent? Um, there are precedents to these types of changes. We've seen that happen in the past, if you think of the Industrial Revolution or the, the IT Revolution more recently. However, these uh, types of changes were driven also by technological breakthroughs, while this one, the, the decarbonization, um, similar in scale but would need to be driven fundamentally by policies. Of course, technology and other things will have a role to play uh, and are important parts of the component, but um, ultimately it's, it's also to a big degree a policy challenge. So the question is what could effective decarbonization policies look like and what should they look like? And then to complement this, this sort of uh, this angle from, from theory, um, to match it with where do we actually stand in reality? How close is EU climate policy to this ideal uh, of decarbonization policies? Uh, we do have fantastic, far-reaching and very ambitious targets in Europe, but do we also have the policy instruments to follow up uh, on those targets, uh, the institutions and also perhaps the political appetite to, to match uh, the ambitious targets? Those are some of the, th the, the items we want to reflect upon. Um, and with that, uh, I would hand over to Michael to give us sort of his summary of what should effective decarbonization policies look like and also where does the EU stand in this respect. Um, we'll have uh, a, 
uh, an introduction, an impulse from, from Michael first, and then uh, we'll go into discussion, bringing in your questions uh, that you posted online, as well as uh, questions that I might have. Michael, the floor is yours. OK, thank you very much indeed, Benjamin. And um, I've got a slight echo on the line, so I think we can mute that. Um, is that clearer for people? Great. Um, I'm going to start with uh, some of the fundamentals as quickly as possible, but they are pretty core to understanding where, in my view, some of the EU climate policies have uh, gone a little bit awry uh, and where some of the solutions might be found. So um, I'll go through pretty quickly. Apologies for those who may be familiar, but on the first main technical slide I have here, um, you'll see a slightly complicated diagram which tries to capture actually quite a simple idea. Um, in the middle of that diagram you'll see something called the best practice frontier and to most economists they'll recognize that concept, they may call it the supply curve of options, it's basically the idea that you can get m you more, more resources vertically will deliver more output horizontally. That's what the basic concept in, in the, the shape of that graph is. Um, and a lot of economic policy and a lot of the logic of markets and prices is founded upon the assumption that we have a fairly fixed set of technologies and that people in markets are rational actors who will make the best use of what they've got and make optimal trade-offs based on the prices. That basically means they're sitting on that curve in the middle called here the best practice frontier. Um, and there's, of course, vast amounts of theory underpinning that, broadly grounded in neoclassical and welfare economics. Um, the point that, that underlies uh, the argument uh, in the book that Benjamin referred to is that actually quite a lot of energy doesn't really sit, and a lot of energy systems and behaviors don't really sit on that line in the way that we tend to assume as economists. Um, first, on the left-hand side, there is no such thing as a perfect, rational, foresight-optimizing decision-maker. Everyone has imperfections. Every system has imperfections. They lie to somewhat to the left of that, which means there are structural inefficiencies. This tends to be most obvious with respect to energy efficiency and the wastage that we see lots of technological evidence that we still don't use the, the, the best options available. We still have ways of both using less energy or other resources with more economic output. In other words, we have lots of potential in principle to move our societies closer to that frontier of best practice. Um, but when we are looking at transforming energy systems, uh, we are also uh, dealing with technological evolution, technological change, the forces behind it, the infrastructures that enable us to use new technologies more effectively, more widespread. That means we're looking at how that curve moves, how it moves to the right to enable us to get more economic output out of the same resource input and how that curve evolves, which could be either in directions that use more carbon, as implied by the arrow pointing slightly upwards, or a lot less, the arrow pointing down to the right. So what we're really after is a combined evolution of what in the books call these three different domains. So on the left-hand side, the behavioral and organizational factors try and bring us closer to the best use of what we've got, the best use of markets to facilitate the right prices, the right, you know, op best use of, of resources, and at the same time trying to drive the, the frontier of technology, infrastructure, etc., down to the bottom right, i.e. decarbonizing the capacities of our energy systems. And that's really important because this problem, more than any other, involves 7 billion individual consumers and all of their perfections, but also the transformation of some of the most complex technological and economic systems that, that we have on the planet. Um, those are not competing explanations. They are simply different processes that occur in our different si in our economic systems. Now, in the next slide, you'll see the kind of so what in policy terms, uh, which is 
what I describe as a matrix in which we are trying to map policy instruments onto those different domains of behavior. So in the middle column, what you'll see is the classic economic markets philosophy where what matters is getting the right economic signals into markets. That is of the highest relevance, of course, where people are already behaving as optimizing decision makers based on relative prices. Therefore, the central box in this matrix where you see the highest relevance of markets and pricing to the second domain of, of behavior. Uh, markets will also have some impact on those other domains. If you bump up prices high enough, you may kick people who'd kind of ignored their structural inefficiencies into actually paying attention to their energy use. But that may not be the most efficient or politically acceptable means of doing so. Actually, we found that energy efficiency standards or strategies to engage decision makers, which is the top left box, actually tend to be more politically tenable and, and often more effective in that domain. Similarly, on the bottom right, what you have is the fact that a whole class of policies, broadly termed here strategic investment, typically led by governments because they involve investments that have a long-term positive return that no market actor individually can capture. A lot of the benefits are to do with innovation or infrastructure, spillovers, wider benefits to a society trying to reorient its energy system. So this matrix gives in a simplified form the fact that you really need three pillars to policy. You have to have a pillar around standards and engagement to, to try and get people to make the best use of what's available. You need an effective market as the second pillar, which uses all of what we know about the efficiencies of markets deployed in relation to current technologies and infrastructures. And you need a pillar of strategic investment for innovation and infrastructure. And that is what in the book really maps out the evidence on the, the impact and the role and effectiveness of each of those three pillars and then maps out how they interact, how they can reinforce each other. So if we move on from that and start moving towards, well, how has Europe fared? Uh, sorry, uh, actually just I want to underline on the next uh, substantive slide uh, a quite an important part particularly around this relationship between markets and innovation, which is just to throw out one other piece of data. Uh, the book is full of data. And what this one says is, in a nutshell, what we are seeking is radical innovation and transformation in sectors like energy and construction and heavy energy intensive industries, which unfortunately are at the bottom of this chart of data on the right hand side in terms of their actual innovation investments as measured by R&D expenditure. And I don't have time to go into the full explanation, but I hope the left-hand side of the same graph gives you some sense of the argument, which is that empirical fact is really because of a disconnect between the sheer cost and risk of investing in extensive innovation and the impact and effectiveness on the right-hand side of that chain of um, energy markets, which tend to frankly have a lot of disengaged consumers and very little differentiation of new and exciting products. At the end of the day, it's all electrons. Most people don't really care how those electrons were made. There's not much willingness to pay for electrons made in a cleaner way. So you have this breakdown in the innovation chain, which is why governments have to be particularly involved in strategic investment for trying to transform these kinds of sectors. So I hope that abbreviated explanation at least gives you a flavor of some of the implications, some of the analysis in the book. And if we move forward now to the next slide, uh, I'll start touching on why I think this is a particular issue in European climate policy. Um, so the reason is that if you look at the structure, and we're, we're now on the slide titled by energy European governments dimensions. Um, we're at a curious phase in evolution of European policy, and I mean energy policy more generally for a moment, because what the European Union was really created uh, for, or at least is seen as a 
major objective in in the single single energy uh, act, single European uh, acts of the 1980s is market liberalisation. It's the view that the the key thing that Europe offers to its member states is a single market, um, and in the energy sector, that's captured as what's generally known in Europe as the third energy package with its implication and its structures for an integrated energy market across Europe, i.e. the free trade of energy uh, across the member states. Now, as I emphasize in this framework, that's important. That's potentially valuable. Markets are important, particularly if you can get those competitive structures and you have the right pricing. But there is a risk and I think a tension in Europe that at an EU level, that's what most European institutions have been structured around. They carry the assumptions of neoclassical economics, welfare economics, and in that sense, they've become sometimes rather resistant to the other pillars required of an effective policy. Or you could just say European institutions don't have the tools or the legal mandates to do very much. In fact, you could say their major tool is a negative one if and where state aid rules are used to discourage the subsidization of ultimately transformative change and in investment that's required to tackle these kind of third domain policies. Um, so that's the sort of the key point we have summarized in this slide and I think we see the pinnacle of that with the degree of emphasis in European climate policy on the EU ETS, as if creating a carbon market would in itself solve climate change and would drive the transformations required. Now, we've at some points even seen suggestions that European energy policies and member state policies on energy efficiency and upon renewables have been unhelpful because they've saved emissions and thereby undermined the carbon market and reduced the carbon price. Now that is an extraordinarily back-to-front logic and a confusion of means and ends. And I think the single most fundamental requirement in European climate policy is to recognize at a very fundamental level you have to have all three of these things. What may be appropriate is that the level at which they can be implemented may vary. And certainly at the moment it's member states, not European institutions, that have the dominant role in terms of third domain type strategic infrastructure investments and innovation. There's some of that increasing in Europe, particularly around innovation programs, the push for, for example, the, the infrastructure package, um, but it's still pretty limited compared with what member states can do. One key question is whether and if so how the energy union process may change that, may increase the legitimacy, the funding, the impact of more strategic investments at a European level. At the moment I think that remains unclear. Um, and it's um, one way of looking at this dilemma and the centrality of this, and this is, will be my penultimate uh, substantive slide, is one that is headed, what is missing? Um, I've already indicated uh, conceptually, broadly, but I now link it to this diagram I had about the innovation chain, about the broken uh, innovation chain in energy, because fundamentally, if we want to accelerate the process of decarbonization in Europe and the transformation of the European energy system, then what we need is to bridge the innovation chain from both ends. And what that means is money going in at the front end to the technology push type agendas, the innovation, the build up of new industries and associated infrastructures, which is absolutely crucial. And at the same time, to have the market pull associated with that, the markets digging deeper into pulling technologies through into funding the emergence of new low carbon industries which as I've said has really previously been in the hands of member states through for example feed-in tariffs and that as we have seen in practice has been what has transformed created the solar revolution 
and to an important degree the development of wind energy. Um, and that's just the kind of the power market side of it. But the concept is you're never going to solve this problem unless you have both the push and the pull and the facilitation of effective markets in between those processes. And I think really against that backdrop, I've probably taken my time and I would just like to leave you with the final slide here that is headed on the challenges for European governance um, because effectively I reached the conclusion that you need a multi-level governance framework. The national regional initiatives where a lot of the physical infrastructure and connection issues lie and the complementarity of sources but yes very much then feeding into an overall EU framework that then obviously needs to interact with the international level. Now uh, Benjamin's pointed I could probably spend five minutes on each of these bullet points so I'm not going to uh, I, I hope you've got the right slide in front of you and it may be most useful if I stop talking at this point and just see what kind of questions would uh, would come up in relation to the policy implications and the governance implications of the intellectual and policy framework that I've mapped out. Thank you very much indeed. Indeed, thank you very much Michael for giving us a, a quick run uh, through a very rich um, topic you can it was clear that much thinking has gone into this uh, and we can only sort of skim at the surface of that uh, still I hope it was uh, full of insights and need the, the final sort of list of to do items uh, in itself could be could be could fill another little mini series of webinars um, I would invite viewers um, to to um, at this point also during the discussion if there are if there you know issues popped up on this on this list that uh, people have a particular interest about to to um, shoot those questions ahead. Um, in the meantime, um, I would want to pick up one of the um, questions that has been flagged up already and that, that I think connects to some of the things that you said, uh, which goes um, a bit more into the uh, issue of where the emissions trading scheme fits into this discussion. Um, now you've made it very clear that um, carbon pricing is not the magical silver bullet and not the only instrument um, and, and uh, that it could be misleading and potentially dangerous even to to view of, of carbon pricing as the the panacea uh, to all issues at the same time I think it's it's sort of was clear from the presentation also from the book that that carbon pricing will have an important role to play um, one of the questions there is um, you mentioned these these different um, uh, the different domains uh, where climate policy would be needed. Um, it's also, of course, possible to sort of look at that in a, from a more sectoral perspective. Look at what what needs to be happening in different sectors, um, and what you what you could, the conclusion you could come to there is that um, for those sectors where you would normally expect the the uh, the carbon price to be um, providing the most suitable tool, which is energy and heavy industries for those sectors we will need to be making um, much progress in the coming 10 to 15 years uh, we will you know what, what the what the modeling tells us that uh, the energy sector should be well advanced on the road to decarbonization um, over um, the next one or two decades um, unfortunately that is also exactly the time window where the EU ETS um, appears to remain paralyzed for the time being um, at least if you if you look at the sort of the, the, the current state of carbon price and the current proposals on the table then um, uh, many analysts would suggest that we it will take another decade or more before we see the reemergence of a of a meaningful carbon price so um, the, the somewhat paradoxical situation that that um, at the time where we would need it most and where we could be having the biggest impact uh, we don't have that carbon pricing tool and by the time it re-emerges a carbon price re-emerges um, who knows perhaps we, we, we other policies will have taken over the job right now there are discussions in some member states about you know um, uh, other other instruments to phase out coal in Germany or the UK uh, with its uh, with its carbon price price for as a, as a complementary tool so in effectively trying to fix the, some of the shortcomings of the ETS. So, one question to you would be: Do you do you share this concern that the ETS might be missing its its opportunity? And what could be a strategy to get the EU ETS back into the game and to make it more meaningful on a time scale um, that we need it to become uh, effective? 
Um, well, I think the situation with the EU ETS is um, potentially rather tragic for, the, I think, the reasons that you've indicated. And I think that at the moment, uh, despite the efforts of uh, initially backloading and then the market stability reserve, a carbon price close to five euros sends a, an invisible signal virtually uh, to most of the actors that, that really matter uh, in this space. It's, it's too low to have a significant impact on uh, investment or operational, or should I say, the prices does not have major impact on investment, uh, on operation, and the credibility of the instrument, having witnessed multiple price collapses, uh, is, is extremely limited for investment purposes. Um, and internationally, it also sends a rather dampening signal in terms of the ambition of the Chinese system or, or developments in North America. So I think it's a major problem. And um, to try and wh what do we do? Well, I've alluded to one thing, uh, which is I think the narrative, indeed the concept, needs to change. Is one thing to say it is part of a nested set of requirements. What is its role in relation to those other pillars? From which then follows well, one role potentially could be to have a more focused, targeted debate about the use of revenues from the EU ETS, which in my view has been missing from the conversation, but is very important to the political acceptability, both for consumers in terms of the money is being put to good use, potentially in energy efficiency, refurbishment of homes in Eastern Europe, etc., and thereby helps to protect you from bills and for industry, where I think it is inescapable that one needs a conversation with heavy industry to say you have a structural competitiveness problem. It's not driven by carbon pricing, it is structural, and where and how can the need for innovation in heavy industry, in materials, help to reinvigorate European industry, and what role might EU ETS revenues play in that? So in other words, viewing the carbon price as an instrument of other policy objectives which have stakeholder appeal. Um, I think the other uh, and the flip side of that is we need to uh, drop this idea that nobody's allowed to mention a floor price because it's too sensitive or too legally risky. You know, in effect what we're saying with the MSR is we are doing things to the European carbon market because the price is too low, but we're never going to tell you what we mean by too low. And I just think that is an untenable position. I think we have to say there are objectives here. They require a certain level of carbon price. The market has proved itself too unstable to deliver that. Therefore, we have to map out what prices are required to achieve what aims. And the, the key aspect is even within the EU ETS, we have the instrument available. You have 70% auctions, you can put a reserve price on auctions, you can build in a price floor. If that is viewed as too politically or legally problematic, then I think we need to revert to a coalition approach uh, in Europe to build in domestic floor prices, perhaps on the, the kind of techniques that's been used in the UK, of a tax to top up the difference. And I know the French government has now formally said we urgently need discussions on that, and I think they're dead right. We have to have that now as a serious discussion in Europe. Hey, thank you very much. And um, um, there's just been a sort of question more of a comment, I think, um, on, on particularly this point. And I think you've, you've taken up this point of why why is it actually necessary to say, or why why would one say that the ETS is, is paralyzed um, if it is achieving all its all its objectives uh, and, and achieving CO2 reduction at the level that it should be? Indeed, of course, in that sense, you could say uh, it is achieving its objectives. There is no problem. But you also alluded to the other part of the discussion, which is that if there is at least an implicit uh, expectation that there should be a carbon price that is capable of driving uh, investment into into the direction of low cost, low carbon opportunities, then um, um, that is what the ETS is not achieving. And indeed, it's it's perhaps one of the difficulties of this discussion that um, this expectation well, shall, shall I, um, has never been. Shall I just pick up that because. I think it is a very important 
uh, question. It, it, it reflects a view. I, I think there are two two kinds of reactions to it. Um, one which would tend tends to come more from the the environmental community is well the levels set were not consistent with scientific needs in the first place. Um, the budget anyway, you know, we, we can't use up that much carbon, it's inconsistent with Paris, etc. Um, my, my view, or at least my emphasis, is somewhat different, which is a carbon price or carbon instrument, EU ETS, has several different objectives. We assumed that they all went together. They include achieving a given target, generating a market signal, trying to influence investment using market mechanisms to deliver efficient investment instead of government interference to be a key role in the long run transformation and decarbonization of the industry. Now those are not all the same objectives and what is now crystal clear is that EU ETS as designed delivered only the first of potentially half a dozen objectives we were seeking, um, i.e. sure it's ensured a cap is delivered, what is actually illustrated, which is useful information, is the cap we set was fantastically much cheaper in terms of carbon costs, carbon controls, than anyone thought when they first negotiated the target. In that sense, you could say, well, I was always of this view, you should always negotiate a target and a price together, i.e. an ETS with a price corridor. For, for multiple reasons, but broadly because our expectations are nearly always wrong about how expensive or difficult a given cap will be. And that's exactly what's happened. And I think we need to acknowledge that, move on. If we are serious about decarbonisation, if we're serious about using market-based instruments, clearly the EU ETS is not doing that job. Okay. Um, let's perhaps... Um uh, dwell on other types of instruments as well, uh, not to, to, to focus, uh, um, to run into the trap of focusing too much on, on carbon pricing only and uh, spend a, a, a moment um, also thinking about other types of insurance instruments. Um, and you've alluded to that in your presentation that the um, Perhaps one of the one of the problems we need to confront is that at the EU level there is an emphasis on on pricing tools as sort of the second domain types of instruments um, uh, that that is very very much ingrained in the in the EU climate policy. Um, however, you've also made that clear in your in your book and in your presentation that um, uh, um, pricing tools are only part of the uh, of the instrument package, and we need other instruments to complement that. And one dimension that um, um, I would invite you to sort of spend a bit more thought on um, is to help us understand better what, what could be happening, uh, what could be our responses to the challenges in the future when you think of sectors we will need to decarbonize in, in, the, in the coming decades then you end up with things like nutrition, uh, like mobility, like housing which are very very much related to lifestyles and, and, and how people lead their lives and you can be one can be skeptical about um, uh, about the effectiveness of prices in in, in in driving changes. I mean, it's quite clear that other instruments will need to come in. Um, the question is, though, um, do we even have an idea of what 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 instruments could look like, or are we, you know, after after sort of two or three decades of discussion on how to decarbonize the, um, the the energy and industry sector is are our brains too much hardwired into into thinking about pricing and thinking about technological options and have we um, perhaps sort of developed a blind spot on, on uh, um, how we can trigger behavioral response. So I'd be curious to, to see if you have um, some uh, um, positive examples of how that could fit into a broader package and also possibly if that's something that the EU should be pursuing at all or whether that's something that uh, should better happen at the national or the local or the regional level. Mm -hmm. um, good questions. Um, obviously I'm thinking of very long answers. I'll, I'll try and keep it brief. Um, one of the things I do in the book is emphasize that uh, in terms of the energy sector, I'll leave nutrition aside for a moment, if I may, I know less about that area. But in terms of the energy sector, the problem is really driven by three broad blocks of um, energy consumption. Uh, one is buildings, one is industry, 
uh, and associated and, and electricity production sort of maps a lot a lot into that as well as buildings. Uh, and the third is transport. And uh, whilst not wanting to overdo it, I should we say at least use the illustration that buildings energy use is particularly dominated by first domain type behaviors. Frankly, many of us don't know, don't have a clue how much the buildings we inhabit uh, demand in terms of energy or the associated carbon or how much it costs. We do not wake up in the morning thinking, how am I going to optimize my building's energy use today? We've got other things to do. So it's absolutely replete with these first domain behavioral uh, organizational failures, structural behaviors like the tenant landlord division, which is endemic in commercial as well as uh, in many countries domestic. So, a building strategy has to use those kinds of things of standards and engagement, um, those tools. Standards, there's a case for using at European level, at least for traded goods, and we've in fact got a very well developed European policy on that. Um, engagement issues perhaps less well developed. Uh, another area, I think the emergence of demand side management as part of the capacity for handling electricity may help to improve engagement in terms of building at least electricity use and the capacity of building thermals as, as an electricity store in, in application. Um, at the other spectrum, end of spectrum, I use the transport sector to illustrate the point that we really need innovation and transformation big time um, because frankly we've already got pretty high carbon prices on transport the carbon price equivalent of excise duties in most European countries is several hundred euros per ton CO2 equivalent carbon pricing is going to be completely irrelevant as a principal driver in terms of its pure economic signal um, what we do observe in transport is multiple problems, congestion, local air pollution, etc., 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 a desire to transform transport systems in ways, particularly, for example, electric cars. What does that involve? Tremendous innovation in the vehicles chain, batteries, uh, charging points, transport infrastructure, urban layout um, for cleaner cities, it is a major transformational challenge which I'd say is absolutely characteristic of third domain and the associated instruments requiring a lot of it of, of, of strategic investments um, and in that sense I think Europe has made some progress but maybe more governments and maybe even more cities are leading the progress partly for the reasons I've said the, the EU has relatively little remit to do you know, investments in urban development, for example, maybe a little more in terms of uh, high-speed electric trains. Um, but you need to see that's the kind of package you need to think at. That's the kind of level we need to think at. Um, on the the other example you you gave uh, of nutrition, I, I think we'd need to bring in experts in what drives personal choices. It gets linked with obesity concerns. Again, lots of complex drivers. But again, the underlying theme, to solve climate change, you're really moving from a discourse about environmental policy or carbon pricing into how do you transform various sectors and associated behaviors in our economies. Great. Thank you very much. Um, to follow up, perhaps because you, you uh, went into also the issue of well, um, the third domain, as you, you call it in the book, um, the, the strategic investments into, into low-carbon technologies. Um, one question there is, what could be smart instruments for, for making those uh, strategic investments in the right way? Uh, obviously, we don't have the luxury of, of um, uh, having, you know, sort of a completely technological, technology-neutral approach where we just leave it to the market to sort out which technologies we need. Um, and instead, there will be some uh, amount of picking and choosing, but we've also seen, of course, time and again that where where governments get involved into in choosing technologies, they can also choose the wrong ones, and then they can you know, the, the the consequences can be um, can be costly. Um, so, um, if you have any insights on how should 
policies be designed to minimize the risk of, of such misinvestments? Um, we don't have perfect foresight, we can't have it, but, but uh, you know, what, yeah. what can be, yeah. what are practical ways of, of reducing the risk of investing into the wrong direction? If you can share some insights on that, sure. that would be great. Sure. Um, now, it's an important area upon which I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of thought and care needed. Because obviously the risk is this third domain stuff gets translated into some kind of industrial policy, government involvement. Before you know it, you're talking about central planning and, and that we know all the downsides. Um, so how do we try and approach this? I think one is to look carefully at the modern literature around industrial strategy and where and how to avoid some of the failures of the past, where one does need some kind of strategy. I think roadmaps, sectoral roadmaps, are relevant here. They can inform what kinds of changes do the sectors themselves think are possible, needed, desirable, etc. But in terms of the instruments, I've already indicated around a bit around transport. Uh, let me uh, address specifically the sector I actually know most about of all, which is electricity. I think at least two, two key things. Uh, one of which we already do have significant European progress, uh, which is on interconnection. It's pretty clear that most forms of a low carbon electricity system, uh, insofar as they draw on the major renewable resources, benefit from a higher level of interconnection. More diversity uh, to handle time variation, more ability to draw on the best renewable resources wherever they're the most uh, concentrated, strong, and, and consequently cheap. And I think that's making some progress precisely because it's directly synergistic with the single energy market agenda. Better interconnected systems, a better European market. So they kind of go reasonably together. The other feature, though, is we're looking at much more capital intensive investments uh, with some learning and, and industrial benefits. Um, and an additional problem that if you look at the economics of anything, whether it's wind, solar, or nuclear, low carbon, they're all very capital intensive, very low running costs, which means two things. First, um, the cost of finance is crucial. And second, actually, they end up bearing most of the risks in the spot market that we have. The electricity price in the European single energy market is broadly determined by marginal costs, fossil fuel generators, so fossil fuels plus carbon costs, and yet it's the renewable or nuclear which carries most of that price risk. So it's an extraordinarily unbalanced and unhelpful market, which is why renewable energy has actually hinged on things like feed-in tariffs, which take renewables out of the market. My concern is I don't think that's sustainable when renewable energy rises from 10 to 25 to 50% of the electricity market. Uh, so where I think we need to be looking is at instruments that give some long-term price guarantees, but in a more technology neutral way, and actually in some ways a more efficient way. That's to some extent where the UK is trying to go with its energy market reform, with what's called its contracts for difference on the electricity price, which is basically a fixed price contract, a bit like FITS. Um, and I think what we could look at is trying to spin out a market in long-term contracts underpinned by what as an economist I call a shadow carbon price, a guaranteed carbon price that reflects that damage. And I think a lot more thinking in that direction uh, would be extremely helpful. My final remark in that area is I think the UK experience, as well as the German experience, both show that that is essential to an economically more efficient approach to renewables because it brings down the cost of capital financing hugely. And there's some estimates in the UK, it knocks three percentage points off the weighted cost of capital, which is worth billions of pounds through having competitive auctions of long-term contracts. Great. Thank you very much. Um, as we're getting closer to, to wrapping up, um, perhaps a final question. We're, we're talking to you um, in the UK right now, and in uh, just over two months from now, uh, you will be holding a referendum on whether the UK uh, intends to stay in the EU. 
Um, and also, not only that is sort of not the only symptom, but also in other policy areas, we've seen that the EU has not been uh, extremely unified, let's put it mildly, uh, in, in the last months. Um, and uh, by some commentators have been described has been described as, as sort of dysfunctional in arriving at effective policies. Now that is a um, an unfortunate situation since post Paris we have a, you know sort of we are in a in a situation that could be a new drive for more effective, more ambitious, uh, uh, more more radical approaches to climate policy. At the same time, an EU that um, perhaps is not in its best shape to provide leadership for ambitious climate policies. So um, I would, um, as kind of a closing remark, um, take a, taking a very long-term perspective, would want to hear your views on whether you conceive that the EU could again become a driver and a leader for ambitious climate policies, um, or whether you would rather pin your hopes on, on uh, country-level initiatives or perhaps coalitions of like-minded countries within the EU that uh, take forward ambitious climate policies. Where would you put your, your bets going forward? Um, well, it would be too much of a detour to talk about the EU referendum in Britain. Uh, it's a very messy process. Um, and you know, energy and climate policies to some extent got dragged uh, into it in, in both directions. Um, on a strategic level, I think that there's an obvious connection. The European Union moved from a few member states to 15 to 27, 28 quite rapidly. Um, in historical terms, and what that's uncovered is a very wide diversity of both energy systems and to some extent cultures and concerns uh, around energy and environmental issues. Um, I think that is just a reality and the EU has been, part of the tension is because the EU has been too slow to adapt to that reality and the implication which is you can't have a harmonized European energy policy on all these various dimensions. It, it's not going to work, and that's what we see. Where I think the energy union discussion needs to therefore take it is what are the key energy physically based regions within Europe, potentially up to half a dozen of those, where and how can they be given, if you like, more legitimacy within the EU uh, structure the regionalization of energy policy and where and how do the European rules potentially help that. Um, and I think that actually some of the issues we've touched on of certainly aspects of carbon pricing and its relationships to TTP investment would be actually more feasible to pursue at a regional level. And perhaps, yeah, perhaps those regions uh, may also engage more in discussions or draw on uh, developments elsewhere in the world. I do not expect the EU uh, itself to be a strong leading force in the next few years. Uh, the only possible counterpoint would be if the Juncker sort of investment plan were to be seen as a strategic European plan focused uh, heavily on the energy sector decarbonisation and that became the axis through which we engaged both the European transformation and its relationship to other country developments. But short of that, I think we're looking more at China or parts of North American developments uh, actually leading the next phase and maybe pushing Europe to sort its act out. And it may take external pressure of that sort. Thank you very much. Uh, we might indeed uh, entering into a, uh, a new type of climate policy discussion if we, um, you know, um, uh, coming from, from, from sort of decades where we, where we like to saw ourselves as Europeans as leading in the discussion and then um, seeing that there are other leaders around the planet, well, we can't have uh, too many leaders on this front, I would, I would think. Um, that brings us to a close for this webinar here. Um, Michael, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to join us here. I want to thank all the viewers and, and listeners uh, for taking the time to join us. Um, I hope it's been as insightful for you as it's been for me. Uh, it's certainly been great to have this um, um, concise discussion on on, uh, uh, on sort of quite deep and substantial topics. Um, 
that is the end of the of the eighth and thereby final uh, uh, Polymp webinar. So um, wrapping up that mini series of webinars. Um, however, there is uh, still more from from the Polymp project. You're very very welcome to check out the website at polymp.eu and and browse some of the products that have been developed in this project, uh, including. The, uh, the knowledge platform for EU climate policies, but also other elements. You'll find all of this on polymp.eu. Um, on that note, thanks again for joining us, and have a great day. Thank Bye. you very much. Cheers. Bye-bye, everyone. -bye,